All right, good morning everyone. I think it's time for us to begin and welcome each and every one of you, uh, those who might be visiting with us. We're glad you're here and uh, reaching out to those who might be uh, watching uh, via live stream, then we're certainly glad to have you with us as well. Uh, we're going to be studying this morning from Numbers chapters 25 through 28. Uh, Lord willing, we will look at the remaining, uh, remaining chapters. On Wednesday evening, we'll go up to chapter, I believe it is, 32. So we'll see how far we get this evening, or this morning rather, and then we'll, uh, we'll finish all of that up, Lord willing, Wednesday evening. Uh, before we get started, let's uh, go to our Father in a word of prayer, please. Most holy and gracious Father, we are truly humble that we can come before you this morning, this first day of the week, to consider your word and to understand your grace and your mercy, your goodness. We're so thankful that you have given us uh, your mind through your word that we can understand who you are and your expectations of us, that we can understand truly how to be a holy people, that we might be pleasing unto you. We ask for wisdom, and we pray that we might let Jesus be seen through our lives each and every day that we live. In Christ's blessed name, we ask this prayer. Amen. All right, if you would please open your Bibles to Numbers 25. There will be a text on the screen as well that I hope you'll be able to see. It's always a challenge to consider the font size and to make sure that uh, things can be seen in the auditorium, but hopefully that will be the case. And as we move, uh, move forward this morning, I was reminded of a, of a text jumping ahead a little bit in the book of Joshua, Joshua uh, chapter 14 and verse 7, as we think about this great individual who's going to be the successor to Moses and what he had to say. He said, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him, please note this, I brought him an honest report. And he sure did. Uh, he and Caleb brought honest reports. Uh, we'll see that truly God fulfills his promises. Joshua is going to get, enter into the land, but you start, you start doing the math and you thinking about, uh, think about how old this individual was. He and Caleb were, uh, would have been in their 80s when they had entered into the promised land. And here they are, individuals that stood for God. And uh, I love uh, Caleb's response when he talks about the individual individuals that he wanted to conquer, he said, you give me this mountain. And uh, as Caleb went forth and as he conquered the land uh, by God's providence. Just a reminder of kind of the journey that we have been on as we have seen them come out of the land of Egypt, particularly as we think about this fertile, this fertile land of, uh, of Goshen, as we consider their, their pathway, their trip as they came down to Mount Sinai, and then as we find them in the wilderness of Paran, and now as we go up into the land of Moab, and we're going to hear this, this uh, phrase, Shatim, a good bit in today's lesson as we think about where they are staged at and some of the things that are going on. In the uh, classes that you reviewed thus far, we have, uh, we have seen the uh, death of Miriam, we've seen the death of Aaron, and soon we will, uh, we're going to see Moses as well. So as we think about that and consider all of these things that are transpiring as they get ready to enter into the promised land, is certainly an amazing story, and I think much to be learned from it as we, as we consider. I just wanted to put this map up, too, to give you some, some uh, semblance of the geography of what's going on. Of course, you can see the Dead Sea. We've got the Jordan River here, and uh, as we think about the children of Israel on the eastern side, and you see some of these, these words. I just wanted to, to just kind of focus on Shatim. And really what that's suggesting is uh, acacia, the, the grove of acacia, or the acacia tree that many of the things that we've looked at thus far were made of. But as we look at this land area, it, it's believed that somewhere in this area is where the children of Israel are going to be encamped. And certainly we're going to talk about Mount Peor as we 
consider the, the very uh, terrible things that they engaged in there that's going to cause great difficulty with the children of Israel as well. Great lessons for us to learn. Uh, I always feel very incompetent in going through many of these chapters because uh, there is so much that we can glean from as we transfer to the New Testament, as we look at principles, and as we try to bring things of, of uh, I think, current day uh, value to us as we are on our journey, so to speak, in striving to get to heaven. Another interesting picture I wanted to, to share with you, again, as you kind of look from the west side of the Jordan River. Here's the Jordan, and here is the Dead Sea, but in the distance you can see Mount Nebo. And of course, we know that this is the, the mount where Moses is going to be able to view into the promised land and see the promised land, <clears throat> but he is not going to get to enter into it. And again, as we look at this area here, this is the, the area that, uh, of Shittim. It's believed that these are possible locations of that area. And you'll note that as you go back and look at biblical archaeology and, and see where individuals are striving to identify some of these locations. But I think this is a positive thing that gives us a good general sense of uh, the area and what is going on and, and what actually took place. That these are not some, some fictitious stories that we read about in the scriptures, but these are real things that we can grasp hold of and understand that these individuals went through all of this process. Interesting picture that I wanted to share with you. I know you probably uh, probably can't see these, these arrows, but what this is doing, it's kind of showing you the distance. This is the actual view from Mount Nebo. So as you look out, as Moses would have done from Mount Nebo, and as you see the Dead Sea uh, right here, and then, of course, going on up into the, to the promised land, uh, he could have had a view, as God promised, that he would see it, but that he would not uh, enter into it. That's an interesting view, and, and certainly some of you may have been there and, and actually stood there. I don't know, but if you've had that privilege to go and to see some of these things, that's certainly, uh, certainly very good. And then I wanted to share with you, again, just the present day view. As we think about this area of Shatim, this is where Joshua is going to send out uh, two men that are going to meet up with, uh, with Rahab eventually. But uh, this area where they're going to be sent out. I know I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself from today's lesson, but I wanted just to get a concept of what we were going to see, what was taking place. And again, these wonderful stories that we can turn to in the scriptures and to really engage in all of these things to, to understand the great depth of God's grace, His mercy, His faithfulness, but yet uh, His punishment upon those who would continue to live unrighteously and not consider uh, His words. So here we go. Let's look at what's taking place in Numbers 25 today. It's some uh, what of a very, very unfortunate story as we read about uh, is this, this situation that occurs while they're living in Shittim. And the picture to, uh, to your left kind of gives you an idea of this possible area where they were at. But what it describes for us is they begin, the words are very uh, open, very pointed, and very descriptive as to what they engage in. And so the text tells us that while they lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. And remember, this was the uh, instructions that was given, or instruction given by Balaam as, as he told those individuals how they could really uh, overcome the children of Israel in the sense of getting them involved in idolatry, getting them involved in fornication, and that's exactly uh, what is going to happen. And if you can keep this in the context of the idea, as, as we can see in um, the book of 1 Corinthians, we'll go there in just a few moments, but it seems that through history, <clears throat> in, in many uh, areas of idol worship, that uh, sexual activity was was involved in that. And that's what we're going to see here, and, and we're going to talk about that a good bit. So as we read on, it says, these invited, excuse me, back up, these invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate, and they bowed down to their gods. Now, again, these are God's people. 
that have uh, come through the wilderness journey. Uh, there's some, been some discussion, was this the old generation or was this the new generation? Uh, it seems perhaps that this was uh, members of the, of the new generation. But as we consider that and think about that, let's just look on at what we learn and what we can note. Very interesting words are given here. Israel yoked itself to Baal of Peor. Now that's a term sometimes that, that many of us are, are not familiar with, but if you go back and you think about what a yoke does and what a yoke is used for, particularly with a team of oxen, what's the purpose of it? What's it doing? I'm sorry? Yep, control and guidance. And so you have an, indiv an individual animal that is yoked in with another individual animal. And we see this terminology used, but I, I wanted uh, to think about it. Paul uses this terminology, doesn't he? And so the idea of these individuals yoking themselves or being tied in with Baal of Peor, it says the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. So it's very descriptive. The punishment is swift. And what we find is that these individuals who are guilty, God said they will be punished. And as we go on and look at the text and think about what happens, it says, even with what we've read, I want you to think about the audacity of what we find here with an individual from uh, the tribe of Simeon. And we'll note that individual in just a few moments. But it said, Behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family. Now, now look at what it says. In the sight of Moses, in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. What audacity that he brings this woman in. And even, I, I, I want to be, uh, I think as descriptive as the text here is, I think you're going to see them, their lives taken in the very act. And so what we see is that when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose and he left the congregation, took a spear in his hand, and went after the man of Israel into the chamber, or into his chamber, and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Thus the plague of the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. So when you begin to think about the leaders that were killed, you begin to think about uh, the plague that was instituted by God, and you look at, uh, again, I believe, I'll keep using the term, the audacity of this individual to bring this woman into the camp and to begin to commit that very act in his chamber with her. Phinehas comes and he says... Uh, that the, the Lord will be justified in this or, or vindicated in this and he kills them both. So with that, here's what takes place with Phinehas. The Lord said to Moses, Phinehas the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace and it shall be to him and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. Now we have the names of the individuals that were slain. This is interesting as we think about, uh, and I want to tie this in. I don't know, I, I can't stand here absolutely and tell you this, but we're going to look at the number of the census in just a few moments. And keep in mind where this individual is from. It says the name of the slain man of Israel who was killed in the Midian, uh, with the Midianite woman was Zimri, the son of Salu, chief of a father's house belonging to the Simonites. 
Keep that in mind. Think about that for just a moment as we proceed. And the name of the Midianite woman was Kuzbi, the daughter of Zer, who was in the tribal head of the father's house of Midian. So this was a prominent Midianite woman. Uh, it was, as we look at Zimri, the son of Selu, chief of a father's house belonging to the Semenites, who made this, this, this parade of sin through the camp and who just was very high-handed in rebelling against God as we see it. So now let's look at this plague a little bit closer. Behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite... Well, excuse me, let me back up and get forward here. I'm having trouble with my buttons this morning. The Lord spoke to Moses. And he said, harass the Midianites. So here, looking into the future, this is going to happen. He says, harass the Midianites and strike them down, for they have harassed you with their wiles in which they beguiled you in the matter of Peor and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of the chief of Midian, the sister who was killed on the day of the plague on account of Peor. So this whole chapter has in it for us this, this terrible situation where the people of God were pulled away were tempted and enticed and made a choice to do these things with the daughters of the Midianites and as well as this, this rebellious individual, Zimri, that we've been talking about. And so I just wanted to show you real quick, uh, we've been talking about these areas and here is Shittim, but here is the suggested place perhaps of the uh, Mount of Baal Peor where this particular worship was going on, where they came and partook of the idolatrous feast in, in honor of that God and they also, also partook in the, uh, the, sex, the sexual activities that were involved in the worship to this particular God. So let's stop for just a moment. I wanted to spend some time here and let's think about the consequences of sin. And let's consider what's going on here. The leaders were to be killed in broad daylight. We've talked about that. The judges were to kill everyone who was guilty. Zimri, who was guilty to open defiance, was killed by uh, Phinehas. And God ordered that the Midianites would be destroyed, taken out. And here also, remember this individual of Balaam, called Balaam? What did he really want? It seems that he wanted that reward. He wanted the money that was going to be given to him for doing this deed. They wanted him to curse the people of God. Remember, he wouldn't do that, but he, he did it in a roundabout way. He said, now, if you'll do this and enact this plan, then you can overcome them. Well, he's going to be killed as well as you look at Numbers 31 and 8. So let's look at this application of the consequences of sin. And let's think of some New Testament passages, some things that we can grasp hold of and consider. We all know what Romans 6 and 23 said. The wages of sin is what? Death. And what's that referring to? It's referring to eternal separation from God Almighty, isn't it? But he says in that same text that the gift of God is eternal life through whom? Christ Jesus. That's the difference. But then we also, there are just numerous texts that I, that I could have chosen. And uh, because of time constraints, I wanted to just read some things and share some things with you and go back. And I know you've probably seen these time and time again. But I want to take you over to 2 Thessalonians chapter uh, 1. And let's look at what we find here in this particular section of Scripture, particularly starting in about verse 7. Because Paul reminds the, the, those in Thessalonica that when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? Those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Because remember, we're going to see something in the book of Samuel that uh, obedience 
is desired much more than what? Than sacrifice. That's exactly right. Obedience is desired by God much more than sacrifice. I'm not saying that the things that we do in worship aren't important. But we are to be an obedient people. They were to be an obedient people. And we learn much from that. In this particular text, he goes on to say, These will pay the penalty, talking about those who don't know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes to be glorified in His saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we pray for you always that our God may count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness in the work of faith with power in order that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Beautiful text that tells us and helps us understand the Lord's coming back. And He's coming back with His angels. And He's coming back to basically give... Uh, retribution to those who do not know him and those who do not obey his gospel and to reward those who are striving to be faithful. Sin has eternal consequences as this text tells us. The second thing I want to suggest to you is that sexual immorality is forbidden. And we're living in a day and age where uh, we are bombarded with all kinds of, of things, whether it be through the television, through the radio, through social media, whatever it might be. But we've come a long way from, uh, from Mount Pilate and Andy Griffith, haven't we? For those of you who remember or know what that's, that is. And it's unfortunate as we begin to think about all the things that... Uh, that are being spoken and done and said and, and how, how things are uh, really disregarding what God's principles are. But I want to take you back here for just a few moments. Let's look at some things. 1 Corinthians 10. I want to go there as we try to make some application to these principles. 1 Corinthians 10. And let's look uh, at about verse 8. Remember, this is Paul reminding this whole text. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago in considering Paul going back and looking at all the things that we have been studying and reminding us us that these things were written for our example. We can go back and see these Old Testament situations. And he says and he tells the Corinthians, nor let us act immorally as some of them did and 23,000 fell in one day. And that seems to be going back to the Numbers passage, Numbers 25. I know there's, someone might say, well, why is there 24,000 and why is there 23? Whether uh, some have suggested the rounding process, some have suggesting, remember, the leaders were killed and then others were killed by the plague, that perhaps that is the, uh, the difference there. But anyway, we understand that the Bible is true. That's not, a, that's not a difficulty as you go through this. But what we find here is that immorality is forbidden. And to the Corinthian brethren who were also living in an, an era and a time where this very same thing uh, could be found. And he's telling them, don't, don't be involved in that. And even if you go back, if you'll note, in chapter 6, this is an interesting passage that is very clear that Paul says to them in verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Now let's think about something. What's the greatest prize that any of us have? What is it? Hope of eternal life. Can we be a child of God, the one who spoke this universe into existence? Does he look upon, will he look upon Kevin Morrow as, as a child of his if I will comply with his wishes? That's amazing, isn't it, as you think about that, that he would, that he would know me, that he would have, uh, uh, be mindful of me, that he would love me and have the, the grace towards me that I greatly need. And that's an amazing thought. 
to be a part of his kingdom, to be a part of the, the, of the body of Christ that he bought and paid for with his own precious blood. I have that great privilege. And it gives me this, this hope, which biblical hope, remember, not that I'm hoping. I, biblical hope is desire plus expectation. I expect to get there. That's what biblical hope is. That's the definition of it. But as we think about this, he says, and, and he goes through this, he says, you know, or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither. Now he begins to list these things. Listen to them. Fornicators, or your translation may say sexual immorality or sexual immoral. Nor idolaters, nor idolaters, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. He doesn't stop there. But you see these sexual sins that are listed there, and, and I truly believe we have to continue to teach our children and to share the gospel in a loving manner with others that if one practices these things, that it will cause them to not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what it's all about. Being pleasing to God. And so when we, we, we think about the value of marriage, the seriousness of marriage, we think about the seriousness of choosing a mate that will, that will help us get to heaven and not hinder us getting to heaven. There's just so many topics we could talk about along this line. But the idea here is that it will cause us to be separated from God. He doesn't stop there with sexual sin. He says in verse 10, Nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. But here's what's interesting. Look at verse 11. Such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the spirit of our God. I come up out of that wonderful uh, grave of, of baptism, a new creature in Christ. How beautiful is that? That I can look forward and not have to look backward at my sinful past and all the terrible things that, that, that I have done in rebellion to God. And that he will put a white robe on me. That he will cleanse me. And I'll tell you, the idea of the, the biblical picture, though your sins be of scarlet. We used to raise sheep for many years. And I'll tell you, if you have ever seen bloodstains on a white lamb, you begin to get the picture. And the idea of, of that scarlet... Uh, being turned into something snow white. Beautiful picture in the scriptures. And that's for each and every one of us. That we can pillow our heads and be at peace. Uh, James 1.27, I just wanted to point that verse out to help us realize that we're, we're, to be, we're to live pure lives, aren't we? We're to be helping those who are in need. We're to live to, to be live unspotted from the world. And then what's interesting too, I wanted to take you over real quickly. I know I'm spending a bit of time here, but tucked away in the book of Revelation, in chapter 2, there is something that is mentioned here that's exactly what we're talking about. The same principle as um, we begin to think about The church at Pergamum. Remember, I'll just skip down to verse 14. But I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam. Ah. What's that doing here? All the way over in the book of Revelation from where we're studying. What was the teaching of Balaam? Who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. 
So that's, that's there for us to consider and to think about that we too not allow ourselves to be caught up in idolatry. We too not allow ourselves to be caught up in sexual immorality. As we live in this day and age where it seems the marriage bed is just something that is, well, you can get married if you want to, if you don't want to, that's fine too, um, so forth and so on. That's not what God says. And so, what I want to suggest to you, this application of the consequences of sin, think about, I know we talk about this a lot, but think about this idea, God must come first in our lives. I suggest to you that that's easier said than done. Not that it can't be done, but we need to constantly focus on that. And I include myself in that as well. You remember over in the book of Mark, over in the book of Mark, I want to take you there to this interaction of Jesus between he and uh, the leaders. And let's particularly look at uh, verse 29 of chapter 12, please. Remember, that they, they came and they asked him, what commandment is the foremost of all? What's the greatest commandment, your translation may say? What's the, what's the greatest one there? And this is what Jesus says. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Remember, isn't that what the burnt offering was really contemplating? When everything was burnt up and given to God? Isn't that what we'll see in the future? Isn't that what Romans 12 says that uh, we, our bodies are to be a living sacrifice? And so Jesus goes on to tell him, the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other greater commandment greater than these. He teaches that same principle in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, I believe it is, where he said that we are to treat others like we want to be treated. That's hard, isn't it? You ever get mad at somebody who steals your parking spot? Who cuts you off on the I-65? Get a little irritated? Someone who gives you a, a very unfriendly gesture out the window as you're driving along. You read that happen? <clears throat> it's easy to love those who we love, but it's when we think about loving those who are tough to love. And, and let's, let's just be honest. Are you ever tough to love sometimes? I think perhaps we are. I know I am. And we look at this and we understand about putting God in our lives and we think about um, loving Him with all our hearts, all our minds, all of our strength. And putting the kingdom first as we find in Matthew 6 and 33. And in Colossians 3, I wanted to take you there just real quickly. I know I've spent a lot of time here in this, but I, I think hopefully... Uh, God's Word is so rich and has so much to, to encourage us and to help us <clears throat> and remind us. The book of Colossians, Paul writes this, particularly chapter 3 is where I wanted to go. And I know I've got several verses here, but let's just read through this for a second because I think it corresponds with exactly what we're saying here. If you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. How often do we think about heaven? I hope you do a lot. I need to do better. How often do we think about uh, the glory of God's presence someday? And to seek the things above, the idea of, of putting those principles in my life, that I'll be an honest person, that I'll be a loving person, that I'll be a person that loves my neighbor as myself, that I will do all of these things that we're discussing. He said... Seek those things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. For you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will be also revealed with Him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. Now think about this with what we've been talking about. To immorality or fornication. To impurity. To passion 
to evil desire, greed, which amounts to adultery. For it's on account of these things, please listen, that the wrath of God will come. What happened at Shittim? What happened with these individuals in, in, that we're studying about? The wrath of God took place because of their ungodliness. And we are not immune to that. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them, but now also put, in, put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. And he goes on to talk about this renewal that is taking place with us. That we are to be children of God. And we can be. And I want to suggest this to you. Paul told Timothy, godliness is profitable for this world as well as the world to come. You want to find peace. You want to find true joy. I'm not saying that everything will always be wonderful, but you want to find true peace and joy in this life and understanding of this life and purpose for this life. It's in Christ Jesus. It's nowhere else. It's in Christ Jesus. All right. Let's talk about the census here real quick. And we move to the next chapter. We think about chapter 26. And there's another census that's going to take place now. And same principles that are in place with the first census. And I'll show you a chart here in just a second. And a couple of things I think are the purpose for this. We're going to determine the men for war. We're also going to determine who gets land allotments. Remember, we're getting ready to get into the promised land. So the land's going to be divided and we're going to have land allotments. So I know this is probably a bit small, but I hope you you can bear with me and take time because it's very, very interesting and a lot of things can be pulled from it. What this reflects is, of course, the tribe. This is the first census and this now is the second census. This is the old generation and this is now the new generation. All right? And then we've got, a, for, for, for those of you uh, accountants in the audience, we've got percent change, okay? And you can look at that. that that's, I find that a bit interesting too, but it's, it's really unique. And so we go through this and we find that in the first census, men 20 years and up who could go to war, 603,550. Now in the second census of the new generation, remember, what has happened to all of these folks now? They're dead. Except how many? We've got Caleb and Joshua, don't we? Of these fighting men that are numbered. All right? Think about that. Two out of 603,550. And so we throw out the question, why? Was it God's fault? Did God not do enough for them? Did God not share enough of His love with them? Did He not show Himself to them enough? Certainly not. You go back and look at time after time after time after time. He was so gracious with them and yet they chose not to believe and not to have faith. So now we've got this. And what I find so interesting about this is that in the, the wilderness and with all the things that are going on there, we've only got a difference now of about 1,800 people. God bless them. And they were mighty. They were strong as we consider what was going on. And we see also, I just pointed out, as you think about uh, the one with the greatest loss is Simeon. 62% negative change. Remember, where was Zimri from? What tribe? Interesting. Interesting. So now we number the Levites. Remember, they weren't numbered in the first census. At about chapter 3, we get some numbering from them, but now we get the numbering of the Levites. And I just wanted to list this here because of, again, time constraints. We've got about 23,000 every male from a month old and upward, for they were not listed among the people of Israel. That's the numbering of the Levites, 23,000 as we find. And remember, what tribe was Moses of? The Levitical tribe, wasn't he? So let's think about God keeping His promises in this text. These were those listed by Moses and Eleazar the priest. 
because we've already discussed who has taken Aaron's place now. Eliezer is the one. And they are listed on the plains of Jericho or Moab by the Jordan. But among these, there was not one of those listed by Moses and Aaron, the priest, who had listed the people of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said of them, here it is, they shall die in the wilderness. And not one of them was left except Caleb and Joshua. Could God deliver his people to the promised land? Could he continue the lineage of Jesus Christ and bring about his plan? Even though there was a rebellious mob? Absolutely. And he did it. So then we find the daughters in chapter 27, the daughters of Zelophad. They have a unique situation. And what we find is that... Uh, there are no sons to, to bring about the inheritance of the land. And they bring a meeting to Moses and God speaks to them and they are given their, their uh, I guess you might say, their request in that they are going to be able to inherit their father's uh, land. So with that, also in this text, what we find is this great individual who's going to succeed Moses. Think about Joshua. The Lord said to Moses, go up to this mountain of Abiram and see the land which I have given to the people of Israel. When you've seen it, you shall also be gathered to your people as your brother Aaron was. You ever thought about who was there when Aaron passed? Moses. He witnessed that. He saw that. And now what we find is it's Moses' turn. He's going to see the land and he's going to be gathered to his people. And the reason he wasn't, it's, it's restated here, because you rebelled against my word in the wilderness of Zen. And you quarreled, or uh, when the congregation quarreled, failing to uphold me as holy at the waters before their eyes. And that took place. And that's, uh, we find Joshua to succeed Moses. And so Joshua is given that particular place. I want to try to run through this just for a second and before our time is up. I want us to note in application God's fairness and concern for the defenseless. You see that throughout Scripture. He ensured the needs of the women would be met. And also, time will not allow us to do that. But in Joshua 17, we find these individuals mentioned. Their land is, is given to them in, in, in name of their father. And we also see throughout the Old Testament the provisions for widows. In, in the book of Exodus, in Deuteronomy, we think about James 1 and 27. We consider all of these texts where we can find God saying, You must not... Treat widows and orphans and the defenseless in an unkind manner. Throughout, to be good to the poor. All of these things that we find throughout this text. And I see God's fairness, His concern, uh, just dispersed throughout the text. And, and that, I think that helps us uh, in a great deal in formulating and understanding who we are to be. But also a continuation of the work. Think about this. Moses now to Joshua. Moses has been involved in this work for so long, but now it's time for him to step aside, and Joshua is going to step up. And I want to take you to a passage over that in 2 Timothy real quickly that Paul spoke unto um, Timothy. And what we find here is the idea of... This transference of entrust to individuals who will be able to, to carry on. And he says, And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Remember the Hebrew writer is... Uh, they are they are the Hebrew people rather the Hebrew Christians in the book of Hebrews are chastised because they have not developed enough to become teachers they're still on milk when they ought to be eating meat they haven't grown up 
And so we think about the development of leadership within the church. We think about elders and deacons and evangelists and teachers and song leaders and Bible class teachers. And, and every indiv- no matter where it may be, we all, I want to suggest to you, we all have a purpose and a place that we can be uh, productive in the kingdom of God. And I'll tell you, folks want to know that we care about them. I'll never forget, years ago, my first job out of college was I was a school teacher. And we had a, we had a, uh, a training session and some individuals came in and said, I want you to remember the, the, your favorite teacher from your school days, from, from elementary or high school. And I'd ask you all to do the same thing real quick and I bet you somebody pops to your mind. And you know what the common theme was why everybody said that was their favorite teacher? Because they seemed to care about me. And I'll tell you, may we develop the love of God that we care about others and that we will continue the work and that we may reach out to those around about us. Thank you for your kind attention today. Appreciate, uh, appreciate you being